Great. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, today, we're going to talk about Chapter F3.0, which is interpreting an image uh, regression. Oh, and I can turn off the video too. Um, and this chapter is pretty narrowly focused just on regression. Um, I'm going to be talking only about regression kind of in the Google Earth Engine context. I'm not going to be talking about like what regression is, how to do a regression, kind of the theoretical basis of regression too much. Um, but we will do kind of an overview of the chapter, uh, some of the theory, and then dive into the practicum. Um, these slides can be found at the link here. Um, and perhaps Andrea or Jeff, if you could drop that into the chat, that'd be fantastic. So a quick overview of the chapter. Um, our goal today is to learn how to use regression to interpret imagery in Google Earth Engine. Um, to do this, we're going to be learning about Earth Engine reducers, uh, understanding the difference between regression and classification, using reducers to implement regression between image bands, and then um, we'll be evaluating regression model performance, both uh, kind of visually, informally, as well as um, numerically. Um, this chapter assumes that you know how to perform some of the basic image analyses that we have talked about in the last couple of weeks, so part F2. Um, including how to use the normalized difference to calculate vegetation indices. And also, like I mentioned, that you have an understanding of regression. So this is only regression in the Google Earth Engine context. If you need to learn how to um, do regression more generally, there's a host of great online resources for that. So a little bit of the theory here, um, regression versus classification. Uh, for regression, we're talking about numeric dependent variables, and for classification, we're talking about categorical dependent variables. This is really the biggest split. It's what are you trying to predict? So when Andrea talked about classification uh, two weeks ago, she was looking to classify things like land use, land cover, things like that. When we talk about regression today, we're going to be trying to, uh, or we're going to be focusing on numeric variables uh, for our dependent variables. We're going to be using the example of tree canopy cover expressed as a percentage. So that's a number, not a classification. You could theoretically uh, bin these percentages and turn it into a classification exercise. For example, you're trying to classify uh, quartiles of uh, tree canopy cover, but uh, that's the key difference. And just think about that anytime you're trying to figure out which of these approaches you should be using. Generally, uh, regression in Earth Engine and more broadly, but particularly in Google Earth Engine breaks down into five steps. Uh, the first one is to put together data about known instances of the dependent variable. This is your training data. Uh, it might be, for example, known areas of species occurrence, known areas of tree canopy cover, known landslide areas, anything that has that dependent variable. Second, um, you define and select your independent variables. This might be something that you need to iterate on. Again, thinking back to what Andrea talked about in the last couple of weeks, depending on how good your outcome is. The third step is to run the regression to generate an equation. Um, and this describes the relationship between the dependent and the independent variables. And sometimes this is where you want to stop. You just need that equation. Uh, but sometimes you want to use that equation to interpolate um, to a wall-to-wall -wall map from some smaller area of dependent variables. So you may have you know, 100 different data points across, say, the state of Wyoming, 
and you want to interpolate to a wall-to-wall -wall map of the state of Wyoming, right? So that would be step four. And then the fifth step is to evaluate. Google Earth Engine has multiple types of regression functions that you can use to generate that relationship function. Uh, and which of these you choose is based on, I'd say, two main things. The first is the properties of the dependent and independent variables. And the second is how many variables you have. So properties include things like, is it a categorical or a numeric uh, variable? So going back to the choice between classification and regression, excuse me, which again are really two sides of the same coin. Um, and this really reflects kind of the regression decisions you make elsewhere. So simple, multiple, univariate, multivariate, things like that. Um, the, I will say if you are coming from a programming um, environment like R or Python, uh, the options here are, I will say, less broad or less well-developed. So if you're looking for a specialized regression function, you may have some trouble. However, Google Earth Engine does have a lot of great examples, uh, a lot of great functionality so far, um, and you can always kind of go back to your first principles in order to build out additional functionality. There are also um, equations or uh, functions and programs that other people are actively developing, so you can always Google and look for those as well. So reducers, um, I will talk very briefly about them here because we will use them. However, uh, we will talk about them in more depth in future chapters. So reducers generally summarize spatial data over space, time, and band information. So if you recall thinking about and exploring the properties of different image collections, that we did over the past number of weeks, reducers kind of sum that into, you know, one number, a one uh, band, depending on the reducer. So Google Earth Engine uses these with great frequency. Simple reducers include things like taking the median or reducing region. So, uh, this is how you do a lot of the, uh, the, the focal statistics, zonal statistics, things like that. There are also complex reducers and that's where regressions come in. Let's see. So let's go ahead and dive into the practicum. Two quick things uh, to access the book scripts in Google Earth Engine, if you haven't done this previously, there is a link that is repeated multiple places in the book. If you click on this link and don't immediately see the repository pop up into your, um, into your scripts, you can click on this refresh button and it will pop up. It should look like this. And also we're gonna be talking about a lot of functions today. There are a couple of different ways of finding more help for these functions. This includes your docs tab, which is this one here. There's also a question mark in the upper right hand corner of the Google Earth Engine code screen. You can click on this and then go to the user guides and then use the filter function. There's also tools like Stack Exchange. So just kind of traditional, I'll say programming avenues for getting help. In section one, we'll talk about linear fit. So this is the simplest type of regression. It is used when you have one dependent variable and one independent variable. At a baseline, if you're familiar with regression equations, it's your very basic y equals a plus bx plus your error. So Again, what the regression is going to do is we're going, or what the, the Google Earth Engine um, kind of 
is going to do is we will provide it with y and x and it will provide back estimates of the constant and all of the coefficient or all of the um all of the betas for um for the regression equation so this first example we're going to have one dependent variable and we will use modus based tree height and i'll point out this is an example only you probably don't want to use this equation for extremely uh sensitive or high value things um and we will use one independent variable which will be ndvi So thinking back to those steps that we just talked about, we're going to put together our dependent variable. We're going to put together our independent variable. And then we're going to call the regression function. And once we have that regression function output with those estimates of alpha and beta, we're going to create a map using expressions. And I will point out expressions will be talked about. I think it's more in F3.1. So let's go ahead and do it. Let me just drag over this window. Pull up the script. Go ahead and run the script. There we go. All right, so let's walk through what we're doing here. I'm going to gloss over the first part just because this is defining a polygon and um, creating a center and pulling in the image, which is something we've done now quite a few times in the last couple of lessons. The first thing that we do is pull together the dependent built, sorry, the dependent variable by filtering the image collection. And then it pulls out one of the percent tree cover images. And if we turn off the subsequent steps and just have the percent tree cover, we can visualize that information that we're using as our dependent variable. We also have it printing out some information about the image here. And this layer, let's see, don't forget, you can always use the inspector. And it will tell you more about what the values are there. So you can always do this to see what the percent tree cover is and for example use the satellite imagery base map in google uh, in order to kind of see how those compare i will point out that the base map that google uses for the imagery is not appropriate for analysis that's only really good to use for I'll say to orient yourself to the landscape. It is imagery that's pulled from multiple different sources, from multiple different time periods in order to provide a really nice cloud free image. So you can have two pixels that are right next to each other from five years apart. And it's entirely dependent on when the best cloud free image was. So if you're doing things like looking for percent tree cover in a specific year, it's not good. Um, if you're looking for things like percent tree cover in the current year, uh, again, you're going to have some problems. So you can't trust the map data uh, copyright date down here. Um, and that's just kind of a general warning because I, I will see, I have seen, people try to use this as kind of a, a truth layer, and it's not. So, um, right, let's move on to the independent variable. So this is, again, something that we've done multiple times before. Filtering out an image, 
and it's this one here, displaying it in true color, and then calculating the NDVI. So we're defining the NDVI here using our normalized difference equation, which again, I believe that's chapter F2.0. Um, if you need a refresher on the normalized difference function. The most, or the, the first bit here that we run into that's new for the regression is kind of creating the training image. So in order to do this, Google Earth Engine wants one object that it is pulling all of the bands from in order to do the regression. So you have to kind of say, well, I want this band as my dependent and this band is my independent variable. And you kind of have to take those and squish them together and then hand that object to Google Earth Engine in order to do its calculations. So that's what we're doing here. We're taking uh, the independent variable first uh, because Google Earth Engine expects the independent variable first. Um, and then adding uh, the percent tree. So uh, we have printed this image so that you can see um, some of the information about it. So if we go here, the training image for linear fit and pull that out, we can see that it is an object with two uh, elements. So um, now we can run our linear regression or our linear fit. Um, in order to do this, we take that training image and then we use the reduce region function. So this is a type of reducer or it's saying reduce across this region. And then for, for calling the linear fit, we have to specify what reducer we wanna use. So we're using the EE reducer linear fit. Again, if you want some more information on that specific function, don't forget to use your docs tab and you can just you know, type in linear fit and it pops up right there and you can click for more information. So then we have to give it the region, which is our geometry of Turin. We have to give it a scale. Uh, and this, we're just doing it based on the Landsat data. So 30 meters. Um, you can change the scale if we wanted to, um, you know, have uh, larger pixels in our output. You can just increase this number. And then we're including this best effort true variable. Uh, if you do not include this um, for your, well, for anything other than a very small area, uh, Earth Engine will throw you an error, basically saying, this is a lot of pixels. You're asking me to do a lot of work. Are you sure you want to do this? So we include this variable in order to basically tell Earth Engine that just, just do your best, it's fine. Uh, and then it will kind of manage the server side loads and give a good estimate, but it won't necessarily run millions and millions and millions and millions of pixels because it doesn't need to. So, um, once we've run that, we can inspect the results. And to do this, um, so we've uh, provided the code in order to do this. So we can um, see the ordinary least square estimates, which is the offset and the scale. Those are the two things that the linear fit, um, that are returned by the linear fit and then saved in that object. So we can also print the y-intercept, which is our offset, and we can print the slope, which is that scale. And now thinking back to our steps, this is the fourth step. 
we're going to create a prediction based on this model that we've just found. So again, thinking about our regression equations, we've just estimated that y-intercept, so that's the alpha, the constant, as well as the beta, which is our slope uh, for our one dependent variable x. Uh, uh, sorry, our one independent variable x in order to predict our dependent variable y. So in order to do this, we're going to use an expression to build out that y equals alpha plus y equals alpha plus beta times x. So we see that here. So we're saying our intercept plus slope times NDVI. And then we're going to define each of those. So NDVI is this, intercept is this, slope is this. And then once we feed that to Google Earth Engine, it uses those two pieces, the defined expression and the definitions for each piece, for each of the variables that we've given it. And it will calculate for each pixel what that is. And to, we can turn that layer on and we can see um, the, uh, I'm just going to use the uh, transparency slider here, where you can see that we have expanded the prediction from the one tile of percent tree cover that we had to the entire Landsat 8 image. Now, if we do a quick visual inspection here, using just the satellite imagery, we can see that these white areas here and using the inspector, we can confirm that these have a fairly high percent tree cover based on the MODIS data. Now, if we look at the same, um, predictions from our Landsat 8 image, uh, we can see that it's a little bit um, less high. So that same place that had the modus of a 72% cover is only predicting about a 20% uh, tree cover. And there are plenty of reasons for this. Um, one of which is that NDVI can be high for any number of reasons, uh, not just trees, right? So your grasses, your sh shrubs, everything else, fields is also going to have an NDVI. That's fairly. So the next section is for linear regression. And Google Earth Engine allows you using this function to have more dependent and independent variables. So where linear fit allows for one of each, this allows for multiple of each. So in order to illustrate this, we're going to use one dependent variable and 10 independent variables. Uh, so our 10 independent variables are going to include one constant and then nine bands, so nine betas that are predicted. And we can see, so this is a little bit of a preview, uh, this is the linear fit uh, model output that we generated using just NDVI. And this is what we'll generate using a whole bunch of different bands. So in order to do this, just to chat about this a little bit before we dive into the code. To create the map, we're going to think back to our steps. Um, we need to manipulate an output array. So when we're thinking back to our steps, this is for, um, you know, first step, create the dependent, second step, create the independent variable, third step, 
uh, run the regression. This is for the fourth step when we're creating the map. And because we have a whole bunch of bands now and we will generate all of these betas, um, when we go to create the map, what we'll need to do is manipulate that output array because as it comes out of um, Google Earth Engine, it will be a matrix. So it will be 10 lists, each one having one coefficient in it. Then we will need to project to remove this, to remove one of the dimensions and then make them a list, at which point we can do, uh, it's essentially still matrix multiplication, but it is a, a single, um, a single, uh, instead of having kind of subsets, it's simply a single list. So we can multiply that by our list of uh, bands in order to have the output. So I wanted to highlight this a little bit before uh, we dive into some of the more code nitty gritty, just to give you a heads up that we're going to have a more complex solution uh, or, or more complex approach to this than we did for the previous linear fit. So let's go ahead and grab the screen with the code in it. Oh, and this is the F3.0B checkpoint. We're just going to go ahead and run it real quick. Okay. So for this checkpoint, the main thing that we're changing from a setup perspective is that instead of just calculating NDVI, we're assembling an independent variable from multiple prediction bands. So we've gone ahead and defined those prediction bands here, and those will be pulled from our Landsat 8 image. And then we're still using the same percent tree cover dependent variable. So as we did before, we're gonna create a training image stack for our linear regression. Again, we need to have our independent variables first because this is how Google Earth Engine um, expects them. It's a little bit the opposite of how most other programs, uh, for example, if you're working in R, you will usually have, or you always have the dependent variables and on the left-hand side of the equation and the independent variables on the right-hand side of the equation. Google Earth Engine is just a little bit different. It wants those first, which is fine. So to create that image stack, we're going to use, um, we're creating an image with the value of one. Reminder that that is for our constant. So it'll just be a for, for the entire image area, it'll just be a one. <laughs> um, and then the we will add our bands, which are the Landsat 8 prediction bands that we defined here. So that will be another eight, sorry, nine bands. And then we will add, finally, our percent tree cover dependent variable. So we have uh, created a print that you can see of this which is linear regression training image here. So you can see it's 11 bands, which is the list of a constant, our nine bands that are independent variables, and then our one dependent variable. I highly recommend, it, it sometimes seems like a lot of printing things, uh, but it is extremely useful, particularly when you're learning, to make sure that each step is happening as you expect it to. Um, it, inspecting things frequently is how you get the expected answer. So we now pass it to the linear regression reducer. As we saw before, we're using the reduced region. This time we're using 
the linear regression reducer, and this requires a couple of additional pieces of information. The first is how many X, so the number of X, i.e. R, independent variables, we have 10 of them, and how many Ys are independent, or sorry, are dependent variable, we have one. So you can see that you can actually change these numbers if you had you know, however many of each. And then as before, we have the turn geometry scale 30 and our best effort equals true. So we send this to Google Earth Engine and it will spit back a linear regression. The output of which is, as I was mentioning, a the coefficients, which is a, um, a, a a matrix essentially of with 10 elements uh, and then the residuals. So if you look at uh, the, how do I put this? The thing I always look out for in that I might have a dimension issue because uh, Google Earth Engine will sometimes output, when we get to the chapter on arrays, that will be an extremely important one, but just as a, without getting into it too deeply, Google Earth Engine will use matrices when it doesn't necessarily need to, because that's kind of, when we don't necessarily think it needs to, it does because that's how it works. So we have to manipulate things out of those into the correct format that we need. And I always think, um, I always like to print these because if I see, sure it says it's a list of 10 elements, but if I can expand each one of these, this means that it's, a, it's basically a list of lists. And this is why we need to reduce the dimensions for this. And we're just gonna tell you kind of how to do it here. We will get into kind of the nitty gritty of this in a future chapter, but for now, uh, we take the array, we project it in order to remove Instead of just instead of it being a list of lists, it will just be a list. Um, and we project it to a list here. And then if we print that coefficients, I want to just point out the difference here. So where our raw output, you could see that you can expand each one of these elements. And it's the same number, which is how you can tell it's a list of lists. Our output of our, our revised coefficients is simply a list. None of these you can expand. So it is um, it is simply one list of numbers instead of being a list of lists. Um, and now that we have it in this single list with 10 numbers in it format, we can use it to predict tree cover based on our regression. So if you recall, the first element is going to correspond to our y-intercept, and then the next nine um, are going to correspond to each of those predictions of beta for each of the bands that we used as independent variables. So what we wanna do here is create, uh, this piece is actually the same as um, the start of our, of how we created the input matrix, right? So it, it takes the image of ones with our prediction bands and squishes them together into one list of bands, kind of one stack of images is how you can think of that. 
And now what we need to do is we will multiply that by the coefficients. So it will multiply each one by the appropriate coefficient. We then want to use the sum reducer, which for each pixel will take the sum of all the multiplications, which if you think about it is is the same as you know it's one times alpha plus beta times the first band plus beta two times the second band plus beta three times the third band etc summing all those up into a single number which is our output our, our appropriate output and the appropriate predictor for the uh, dependent variable based on the information that we have provided to the to the regression. So we use the rename function here in order to give it a name that makes human sense. It's basically for our ease. And then we just clip it to the geometry in order to make sure that there's not extra stuff. So we can then add that prediction to the map. And we can see, even though this has the same min and max as our predicted tree cover, we can actually see that it has a very different prediction. And if we just do a little bit of visual inspection here, comparing them, we can see that we have different values um, and very different outputs. The one thing I will uh, point out is particularly different is things like um the river as well as some of the uh mountains so this is something that's good to kind of always do as a visual check is are we getting things that we expect and so i will point out uh wait for on this to load for a second okay so if we see the ndvi prediction it predicts pretty low values so black is zero white is 100% tree, uh, predicted tree cover. It predicts low values in the river. However, for the uh, many bands, it actually predicts higher values for the river. So uh, there's, you know, you can think about the surface reflectance properties of different things across the bands and you might come up with some reasons why. But it's always good to look at why like what's happening with your output is it what you expect does it make sense so again you can use the inspector for this let's just pick a nice nice agricultural field here boom so the the modus has a low percent tree cover and the uh, predicted percent tree cover is actually not too far off for the NDVI, uh, but it's actually negative for the for our most recent uh, linear regression. So it's always good to kind of uh, compare around and see what is matching, what is not matching. And then we also can look at the input image and we can start to tease apart why that might be. But in the interest of time, we will not do that today. And section three, we'll be talking about nonlinear regressions. Nonlinear regressions so far in Google Earth Engine are implemented using classifiers. 
So this is the same as what we used in F2.1 and F2.2 that Andrea talked about over the past two weeks. It's implemented using CART, so classification and regression trees. It's just the regression part of CART. In order to do this, you do need a feature collection. And we will briefly touch on these, uh, but for more detail on feature collections, please look at F5. Uh, feature collections are essentially, extremely simplistically, um, the vector version of image collections, which are rasters. So we will use the classify function for our step four, which is to create the map, which is very nice because we don't have to do any of the really complicated, you know, any complicated equations or um, manipulating arrays in order to come up with that, uh, in order to create the output map. So it's a very nice, very nice system. So without further ado, let's go ahead and look at the code for it. And this is the F3.0C checkpoint, which we'll just run quickly. So the, I would say that the biggest thing that we're going to learn here is to use the, is to learn how to sample the training data in order to feed it into CART. So again, um, the, The uh, classification and regression tree is the same approach that we've used previously. Um, and I'm not going to get too far in depth into the theoretical underpinnings of CART. Um, there's, again, lots of really great online resources, uh, including the user guide and the docs here in Google Earth Engine. But to do this, the first thing we're going to do is to create the training data stack. We don't need to add the constant here because it's a cart, it's not a linear regression. But what we're gonna do is take that Landsat image and select the prediction bands, which we defined previously. It's that list of nine. And then we're going to add the percent tree cover, which is our dependent variable. So now that we have that training image, we're going to sample it. So if you recall, I said that um, the cart requires a feature collection. And this is how we get it, essentially, is we take that stack of images and we're essentially randomly sampling from all over uh, and extracting the list of values from each band at each of those points. So what we're saying here is take this training image that we've just created and then sample it um, using, you know, sample it this many times, 1500 times, uh, and we can specify a seed. Uh, we specify a seed here in order to make it reproducible so that the, the, it basically produces the same result each time. If you don't want that, you can just not use it. But it will use random seed. Um, and then we can examine the resulting training data. So as expected, um, it has 1500 elements because we asked for 1500 
uh, samples. Um, and we can look at each of those and it's a, we can see that it has 10 properties. Uh, that is, it has 10 values from that stack of images. And again, F5 has a lot more detail about these and kind of their, um, their format in Google Earth Engine and how they're put together and what they require and how to manipulate them. So in order to run the cart regression, uh, we use the smile cart function that Andrea has uh, used previously. We use the output mode regression, and then we define the training data uh, with the training data that we just created. And we specify what the input properties are. So these are our independent variables. And now that we have a cart regression object, it's pretty simple uh, to just create our classification or expand, apply that classification across our entire study area. So we just use, you know, here's our input image, select the prediction bands, and then apply the classification from this regression that we just created. And so that's what we have here. Um, so it's pretty straightforward and I'm not gonna get too far into detail here because Andrea spent <laughs> a lot of time over the last little bit uh, going into detail about this particular function. Um, the last section, section four, talks about root mean square error and calculating this. This is a really brief overview. I just want to mention um, the code to do this is fairly complex and it requires like in order to really understand it very, very well, it requires information from future sections. So I really suggest um, if, if you have like specific questions about this, go through those future chapters and then come back uh, because a lot of it will be answered there. And a lot of it is not necessarily um, kind of appropriate in the current learning curve uh, to get into too deeply. So we're not gonna get into this super, super deeply, um, but we did want to show people how to evaluate regressions um, from a root mean square error perspective as a, and in addition to kind of the visual inspection that we've been talking about. So this is um, included, let's see, at the end of code checkpoint, of the code checkpoint we just did. So F3.0C. And then let me just, there we go. So we're gonna want the console for this one. Move this guy here a little bit. Okay, so um, the basic approach here is we're going to squish the data together we're going to sample it, and then we're going to use a whole bunch of math steps in order to create the maths for the, for calculating root mean square error. So um, the image concatenation is essentially uh, we're we're squishing together our um, dependent variable, our training data as well as our three predictions. And this is really for our ease of use. Um, oops. So that um, we can uh, view the three of them pretty easily. So we then are sampling uh, the concatenated image and that will provide basically data points of the expected value 
and the predicted values, which, let's see. Um, and so we just print out the first sample here uh, just to show what the concatenated data looks like and what this sample looks like. Um, so for example, there's a CURP prediction, uh, the uh, linear fit prediction, the linear regression prediction, and the tree canopy percent. So this is the dependent, the original training data. And these are all the predictions of that um, dependent variable that we obtained through the various regressions. So our first step is to compute the square difference between the predicted percent tree cover and the known percent tree cover. And this is actually why I said at the start that this is kind of a little bit of a toy example. Um, the MODIS data is not 100% correct. Um, and so frequently for your dependent variable, for your training data, you for a, I'll say production environment, what you would want is, you know, you've gone out into the field and field verified. This is LIDAR data and it's high accuracy, things like that. Because the better your the better your training data is, the better your predictions will be, as well as your root mean square error will be calculating to, you know, your known tree cover is actually correct. Um, as opposed to really what we're doing here is the predicted tree percent tree cover compared with the, the modus tree cover. So it, known is a little bit of a, a misnomer here, um, but just as a disclaimer. Um, so we first uh, calculate that squared difference using some of our... Um, our equate our, our uh, operations functions. So the subtract and to the, this is POW is to the power of. So we're taking this, we're subtracting this, and then we're taking it to the power of two. So squared. And this, then we say, please return the feature set of this. So these are the squares that we just calculated up here. Our second step um, calculates the root mean square error for the for the whole thing of the difference pairs. So it's that root mean square error formula. So um, we you know map the difference over the whole collection, and then we take we we use a reducer again in order to get that mean squared difference. And then we flatten it again. There's a lot of operations here that will make more sense once we get through, once we talk about arrays in more detail in a future chapter. And then essentially we squish all that information. It's essentially the, the, um, the big E sum summation, summation across, uh, except here we're doing summation across space. Um, and then we can print that for each of our elements. Um, and actually it would be nice if these were named, but they're not. Um, but the first selector is the, uh, linear fit. The second one is the linear regression. And the third one is the cart. So it's a very fast, um, walkthrough of this. And you can actually just copy paste this code. If you have another root mean square error that you need to, uh, calculate and then just, you know, if you only have one model, just uh, delete the the two extra or if you have five or six models, just increase the number of them by copying and pasting these pieces uh, or, you know, adding additionals here, adding additionals here, um, and then, you know, increasing the number of or decreasing the number of features returned and then the same piece here. So, um, and then you'll just change your repeat value here. So um, the, the um, uh, 
Yeah. So this is also a little bit of a brief introduction to functions. Um, in that, you know, this is one of the first functions that we've that we've created. We go into a lot more detail about functions in a future category, or sorry, a future chapter. Uh, and uh, a lot of these will make more sense later. I would say if you are interested and want to kind of tease this bit apart here, I would say a really good thing to do is to look up each of the functions and then think about what it's doing. You can also insert print uh, uh, commands like we did with the first feature in the sample after each step. And it will just print things up for you so you can see how things are being manipulated um, and that can contribute to your learning. Um, you know, I always find it helpful to kind of tease apart when people who are more advanced than me have uh, created functions, tease them apart in order to understand what each piece is doing. But we're not gonna get too far into that here because that is for future chapters. There are some additional resources um, that I wanted to point out uh, that you can access through these slides. Earth Engine has a great section on reducers if you're interested in more learning more about those. They have a pretty good section on linear regression as well, and they have a piece. Oops, um, they have a piece of code or and uh, explanation for the root mean square error. They actually use it as an example for another, you know, talking about some other functions. So they have they do have an interesting piece on that as well. Um, and, and those all three of those are in the user guide, and they are linked in the slides.